Welcome back to Highly Respected. I'm your host, Scott Greer. Today we've got another incredible episode with just me talking. And I've been saying this in the past, uh, both on Twitter and in the IQ supplement, that we're going to do something on the American Catholic experience. But there's been a lot of news to come in, <laughs> in the fray since then. So we will discuss that later on. And it won't necessarily just be about the American Catholic experience. I will bring in uh, the American Christian experience in general. Uh, where are the trends going and how, it, you know, particularly in regards to the youth. So we will talk, discuss that later on in the episode. But we've got, a, you know, there was some breaking news last week. As you all probably know, on Friday, Nicholas J. Fuentes, a friend of the show, a guest on the show as well, uh, was banned from Twitter. This was the latest ban he's he suffered. I mean, this guy is banned from pretty much everything. He's banned from Facebook, YouTube. PayPal, Stripe, Clubhouse, DLive, uh, I think Airbnb, uh, I think even he's like had some bank issues. I mean, he is, <laughs> he's on the no-fly list. Uh, there are so many uh, persecutions and bans he's suffering, and now Twitter is just the latest. Uh, when this happened, uh, you know, there's a couple different things to talk about here. I think, you know, the one thing I want to focus on first is probably the conservative reaction. We'll get into the larger dynamic of why he was banned, why he's particularly singled out and what this means about the, you know, the system of the globalist American empire and how it operates. But I think it's first noting about the conservative response to him and especially in his appearance at CPAC the next day on Saturday. When he was first banned, there was a surprising number of conservatives who decided not to fully celebrate it, but to condemn it. Uh, I think the first was actually J.D. Vance, which some people got mad that I uh, defended it, but you know, people calmed down on it, on that. Uh, it wasn't necessarily the perfect response because he was like, "This guy uh, mischaracterizes me and attacks me," even though that is true. You know, <laughs> not necessarily time to say it. It's like you just simply say, "I disagree with Nick." Uh, but I think it's wrong that Twitter bans him. That's all you have to say. And it's mostly emphasizing that it's wrong for Twitter to ban somebody for their politics. And to note that big tech is now the arbiter of what's allowed as public speech, which is true, which the left and squishy conservatives believe uh, big tech should serve as this responsibility. This should be their role. So I was criticizing that. Um, and there are some much better ones. Matt Walsh had a really good one where he, you know, the reason why Nick Fuentes was banned is because both the SPLC and, it, and the ADL had hit pieces on him early, earlier that week. And actually with the ADL, they published a hit piece on him and tweeted it out mere hours before he was banned. And I believe it was the ADL hit piece that did him in and it pointed out all about these uh, na supposedly nasty tweets he has and how Twitter gives him a platform. It was designed to say, Twitter, it's time, it's enough. We want him gone. And both the ADL and SPLC delivering that message in articles is what you know drove him off the platform. And Matt Walsh didn't even criticize Nick. He simply said how outrageous it is that these two left-wing groups uh, determine speech on Twitter. They determine policies on Twitter, and they're clearly not nonpartisan. You know, they have axes to grind, and they're fully part of the left-wing coalition. Yet they're the ones who are having the final word on who's allowed to stay on Twitter. That was probably the best response for mainstream conservative. Another one that was pretty good was Steve Cortez, which also a lot of like people were upset about, but... Like, even if you looked at him, it wasn't a direct attack on Nick. It was just simply saying, I disagree with Nick. I, I but I, 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 you know, I'm more worried about him getting banned. And like, some people were just like, how, how can you say you disagree with him? And I was like, look, like there is a limited space for what mainstream conservatives can say in this regard. Simply just saying, not even a direct attack, but simply saying, I disagree with him. It's about the best you can hope for. I thought those were good. Those were better than J.D. Vance's. J.D. Vance's was like in the middle. It's like, uh, you know, you didn't have to say that. But, you know, he is a he could be possibly senator. It is nice that he's saying something at all. But it was obviously not perfect. But then there was worse responses where, um, 
you know, Ben Shapiro is like garbage person with garbage, garbage views. Ah, but uh, Twitter shouldn't ban him. And then they all like all these people began following with uh, like Dave Rubin and all these people. And Chris Rufo is like, he's a vile person who attacks my family. Uh, oh, by the way, I don't think he should be banned. And they're all just like saying all these terrible things about him, which, you know, that was the J.D. Vance formula. But J.D. Vance is wasn't nearly as bad as like saying this is like a vile, evil, disgusting person who should be banned. Uh, you know, they're basically saying all these things terrible about him. And it's like it comes at a point where it's like, look, if you're spending most of your tweet attacking him, you're not really opposing the ban. You're just simply signaling that you hate Nick Fuentes. And then you're giving a lackluster like, but I oppose his ban. You just simply need to say, like, it's wrong to ban Nick Fuentes. And it's like, I don't agree with him. That's it. That's all you needed to say. Uh, but this is hard for people. I think and the funniest response was uh, Dinesh D'Souza, who included an attack on Nick saying he's a twerp, um, but, <laughs> but did say that he is the new Rosa Parks. So, uh, you know, that, I think that was pretty good. So there was this, so there were a lot of conservatives who were, um, Talking about this, and this got a lot of attention from the New York Times, Washington Post, all the big outlets were covering the Nick got banned, which that usually doesn't happen with most right wing accounts that get banned. They just simply, you know, disappear. There's a few liberals uh, uh, rejoicing about it, and that's it. And of course, there's liberals rejoicing about that. But there, there, even the conservatives who are openly rejoicing were limited in number. Uh, which is surprising. I mean, most of the people were following the Ben Shapiro route of just like uh, attacking Nick, but then saying he opposed the ban, which I mean, that's not really that great, but I guess that is better, slightly better than um, celebrating the ban. I don't know. In some cases, I, I think it would be better if, for Ben Shapiro to celebrate the ban. It was just based on who Ben Shapiro is. But it did send a sign. But then all these conservatives like opposing the ban, Completely changed their tune when Nick showed up at CPAC the next day. And now a lot of Twitter was, uh, you know, really in a mocking mood. And it's like any time, I would say, any time the right-wingers show up in, in person in real life, no matter what you look like, you guys could be all jacked bodybuilders who, you know, look like, like the dream men of any girl and they would still find reasons to call you like incels and losers and goofballs and how do we take these people seriously? So all these people are just like saying like no matter no matter what you look like, they're going to use these same arguments about incels and goofballs who just came out of their mom's basement. And that's sure enough what happened with all these people who are gathered around Nick. And when I was looking at this crowd, they're all young kids like 19 or 20. They look like the standard CPAC attendees for, you know, better or for worse. And if you've ever been, to, in some ways they looked a lot, <laughs> they're probably better than the average CPAC attendee in terms of this, like the obvious appearance. I mean, there's some real weirdo kids who attend CPAC, especially, I mean, you can't even, you know, <laughs> you really can't um, attack these kids if you're like from a conservative position and you think about the just the straight up weirdos who are 19 years old and they worship Ronald Reagan and Paul Ryan and care about supply side economics who are going to CPAC just for those reasons. Like how big of a dork are you? And those are the people most, you know, relishing this opportunity to attack Nick and the Groypers. There's all these conservatives who are sharing the video of Nick and the Groypers um, at CPAC and just talking about how really trying to demonstrate how they're more masculine than they were. Um, a lot of some people have gotten mad when I go into names and stuff because like I don't know who these people are. So I would say the typical person was like a fat mid 30s bearded guy who is, you know, having a beard to, to hide his his chin fat and to hide it like his chin and face fat and or even, to, you know, compensate for being bald who is like attacking these guys and like saying, I'm going to punch them in the face. I can beat them up. I'm so manly because I'm a conservative ink shill. I'm an apparatchik. And these are the type of people who were uh, most uh, triggered by Nick showing up. Like one person, I'll go into just a few names. It's like, because uh, this one person I got into uh, a discussion with uh, Drew Holden, 
who clearly grew a beard to make himself look more masculine if he looks and he's like talking about how nick fuentes is somebody is what happens when somebody grows up without being punched in the face and this is somebody who works in dc comms who runs like rnc uh pr and this is the type of person and you thinking that like people like this who work in that are like yeah they're really masking guys who who go out and boxing every week and they grew up rough and tumble and they're working class neighborhood. It's like none of these people are like that. And also most of the people who are working in these jobs. A lot of them are gay and very effeminate <laughs> and not saying this guy is, I don't think he's one of those, but he also like, and he's also is attacking other people for having punchable faces. And then he himself without a beard would be what the left would consider a punchable face because one thing you have to realize about the, the the idea of a punchable face is that it's become a big concept among the left because it is a typically somebody who is like an attractive, uh, confident white man who has like a certain look, like a certain uh, aura around him that would signal like, a, you know, a waspy, preppy type attitude with that. And the reason why we condemn that is because, you know, our society is, is taught to hate people like that. It sees them as the enemy. It's like the, you know, the villains of 80s comedies were always these, uh, you know, waspy frat boys. And that's like the bad, the villains of the, <laughs> the bad guys of 80s comedies movies and 90s comedies movies. And that continued on. And we're supposed to see those people as having punchable faces be while if you're ugly, fat, non-white, you don't have a punchable face because you have a welcoming face. You have the face of somebody that we want it run, representing our society. But these people who represent the old America, these uh, confident white privileged men, they have punchable faces. And it, it's also so the it's a it's a it's a type of resentment when they are saying that type of concept. And if you look at any of the guys with it, it's typically a white guy from a more from what you would consider affluent or preppy background. And he's not ugly. He's not deformed. And he looks confident in his white privilege. And that's why they use the, the punchable face meme. So even this guy has it uh, too, and it's not like he's like a hard nose, like, you know, has like the distinguishing features of a boxer or, or a wrestler or anything like that. And he works in DC comms. He's not, it's not working with your hands in this, in this work. It's not blue collar labor. <clears throat> and there's other people um, like Steven Gutowski. I don't, I'm not sure where he works now, but he's like a big gun guy and Washington Free Beacon dude. He's fat, bearded, once again, all beards. And he went on this like meltdown about these Nazi chodes and their looks so weird and they're dorks. Unlike me, I'm so cool. And it's a, it's definitely somebody they're compensating resentful. And one of the things about this, it's so funny about conservatives mocking the masculinity of these like 19 year old kids is that conservatism Inc is like the worst example of, of comp compensation for masculinity. It's all performative masculinity. It's all these guys who have beards to hide their fat, who, you know, and sit and it's a way to signal and look weird without beards. And it's a way to hide ugly facial features and fat and to show that like, I'm a real man. Look, I can grow a beard. And their whole personality is built around bourbon and cigars and guns, which there's nothing wrong with guns. I don't want to say this, but they the way that a lot of these Connie types, you know, gravitate towards guns, it is a performative masculinity to show that like I'm a real macho guy. I I am I am so masculine because I'm out here. Check out my profile pic with me shooting an AR-15. I got a cigar in my mouth and I've got like a hat that says bacon on it. And this is me being conservative. And next I'm gonna go record a podcast where I'm also smoking a cigar and I got whiskey and we're a wood paneled room. This is what real men do. And that is all like conservative ink. It's all performative masculinity done by dorks, like in nerds. Like these guys are not chads. Like they're not the people who were cool in high school and college. They were not the star athletes. They were not the uh, super masculine guys. And the way they signal through their Twitter and other you know methods of just saying like, I base my personality around bourbon and cigars and I have a beard, I'm a beardo. Um, 
you know, it's all about this performative masculinity that is, you know, lacking substance and lack, and it shows that they lack, uh, you know, they're insecure in their own masculinity. And there are many conservatives like this. And so it's very funny that they're going to, you know, these guys who are constantly in performative masculinity mode, go after these young kids who are 20 years younger than them or 15 or 20 years younger than them, possibly even younger. And they're attacking them for, I would beat them up, says like the fat 40 year old dude in a, with a beard and a, the bourbon in his hand. And it's like, really? Come on, this it's just like an easy target, and it's just a way to make them feel cells feel better. So I would say even when the point when people and the left, of course, is attacking them, and we all know it's like some blue-haired transgender person, multiple piercings, and many other uh, strange you know <laughs> oddities about them who are like saying like how I could beat them up and like like six year old women, uh, boomer libtard women saying they could beat them up. And it's just all this way. It doesn't matter what you look like and the right, you're always gonna be attacked on these grounds. They're always gonna use the same arguments against them. It doesn't matter how good looking you are or how chad or you demonstrate yourself. They're always gonna say these same things about how they can take you on. Uh, you could be a, like I said, a former linebacker who's now a bot who can <laughs> deadlift 600 pounds or more. And they're still going to say how like some all spinster awful is still going to say that she can take you on and beat you up because that's the mentality. You know, that's the Marvel movie uh, ideology in their brains that, you know, if you're leftist and you're woke and you have the right beliefs, you can beat up any racist or bigot in our society. So I wouldn't get too hard on it. I thought it was, I thought people were overreacting when they saw Nick and them. And it's, um, you know, the people who are making these comments uh, have no room to talk. I would just say that. And I've, I've said this before is like the biggest losers I can imagine on earth are young conservative ink types they're they are as i would say this is like you know i needed to find the term reddit americans i said they're reddit americans reddit americans is different from normies and npcs because reddit americans refers to people who are fully enmeshed into the uh, you know de i yeah i would say degenerate decaying culture of american life like they love rick and morty they love bojack horseman they love all these stupid cartoons and shows and they really see themselves represented by the cultural products of 21st century America and they're fully ingrained into it a way that most normies are not like I don't think a lot you know a normie can't be a Reddit American uh, and so can like people are not normies but I would say that a Reddit American category is somebody who is fully fully uh, connected within that culture within the culture of the 21st century America with the Marvel Cinematic Universe and Star Wars, and they're on posting on Reddit. And that is most conservatives. I mean, they, and this has been the way for a long time. I remember, you know, as, you know, going back when I first moved up in, to DC to work in conservative Inc., all these guys were like sharing office gifts and memes and like Parks and Rec, and they're like, bacon, I love bacon. And yeah, they're simply Reddit Americans, and there is something abnormal about that and they realize that and that's why they compensate through these uh, quote unquote masculine cultural means such as beards bourbon and bacon and cigars and even guns to the less than but guns are good we're not attacking guns uh, gun culture is good we highly respect it sports gun culture but it does know there are some weirdos and cucks who get into it to uh, compensate so we just want to point that out and you know, these people have no room to talk when they're complaining about Groypers, especially when they're people that they uh, uphold as like cool and based or bigger loser or way bigger losers than whatever these Groypers, uh, they think the Groypers are. So I just wanted to note that and uh, to not get too hard on uh, everyone was jumping on them. And it's like, well, well, it is what it is. You know, it's I don't I wasn't it's like you see normal like college students. That's all my impression from it. So now I'll move on to the general purpose of why Nick is censored and what it, what it means for you know big tech going forward and global American empire and how they use the social media platforms. 
it's we have to re- remember that social media was developed and was first and was popularized on the basis that it in, could encourage revolutions throughout the third world and in countries where we saw as hostile to global centrists. You know, the Arab Spring was, we all say like, oh, this was the Twitter revolution, the Arab Spring, we love this. And is the CIA, uh, you know, and the State Department setting up these assets who could, uh, trying to topple Assad and they toppled Gaddafi in Libya. And they're just like, oh, we just want to be like normal millennial Americans. And you have to realize at the time in 20, 2011, millennials were still young. We're not the old people we are today, even though I don't, I don't want to say we're too old, but... Back then, we were uh, in our 20s and teens, and the that's who they thought, you know, they wanted to turn the whole world into millennial, millennial Americans, <laughs> and that's what the, that was the promise of social media, and they used this again in Ukraine in 2014 during the Maidan, and it was all about, like, pushing the interests of the deep state in the globalist American empire. Now, and then in 2015 and 2016, the right began using it and began gaming it and, and weaponizing it in a way that, the you know, wasn't in it for its intended purpose and began using uh, being hit back against the global American empire, against the deep state, against the global centrist and people all over the right wingers from all over Europe and America were using it for positive purposes and repurposing it for their own ends. And there's been this effort ever since then to clear up social media so they can use it for, you know, its intended purpose of toppling regimes and governments that they don't like and spreading uh, the idiot, the globalist ideology through LGBT rights and Black Lives Matter. And that's why they have to ban people like Nick and they have to ban all these others. So it's just a cleanup operation because what its intended purpose is to secure the ideology and the interests of the ruling regime and we could see that every day when the twitter trending topics where you know it finds some conservative who said something stupid and it directs people to attack them and it has like a fact check it'll be like uh prager you uh like this one thing i saw re- i think yesterday or today it's like prager you says that anti-racist policies attack america and it's like fact check no they don't and then it directs users to go and attack prager you or whoever the enemy target of the regime is that day and that's how twitter operates and that's why they have to clear us up i mean they still allow a lot of us on there of course i'm still on there for the time being We'll see how long that lasts. And that's, you know, and that's the, per- and we can now see this when, when we're seeing the protests going on in Cuba and all these conservatives are falling for this. And it's, you know, you guys are real- are aware of color revolutions. You are aware of the State Department's role in this. You're aware of the libtards, you know, who are cheer this stuff on, you know, time and time again. And they're going on about like, finally, they're revolting against communism. And it's like, uh, Mm, you know, communism isn't really a threat anymore. And it's like, I, I don't want to defend the Cuban regime. The Cuban regime sucks. It's like this old bureaucratic nightmare. It, it sucks. Like in terms of like regime change, like like what I'd be offended by, I don't really care that they like regime change. I think if it's like a, if it's a nice, easy, like over t- turnover, that's probably, you know, there's some good things there because in, it opens it up and maybe we can flee to Cuba. <laughs> like right wingers flee to Cuba, maybe. I don't think that would work, but you know, I think there are some ways that it could be beneficial. If it's like, you know, there's it you know, there's a nice easy, easy turnover to a new regime that has better relations with us and it doesn't lead to a migration surge, but there could still be a migration surge uh and if there is uh, you know, a long drawn out civil war or, or instability, as we're seeing in Venezuela, where all these people are fleeing to America and all their middle and upper class people move to America. And then they all support open borders and like libertarian economic policies. And it's like, why are we letting these people in our into our country? They should go back to Maduro. Um, we could have a situation like that, depending on with the Cuba. I mean, like, I don't particularly, you know, I don't care about the Cuban regime, but it, you have to realize that this is not happening on its own. It's not an organic process and it's being promoted by Twitter and other social media outlets because the gay, the GAE is behind it. This is who's stimulating these protests. These are who fermenting it. People have to realize this. And it's like, should we really care about this? Should we really care about them fighting for freedoms when in our own country, 
you know, hundreds of peaceful protesters are kept detained for months on end without any, with, you know, no just cause. Should we see this? As, should we care about Cuban freedoms when you're not allowed on social media because of your political beliefs? Should we care about the, you know, Cuban freedoms when you're not allowed to have a bank account because of your bank political beliefs? You know, it, the list goes on. It's like we have so many problems in our own country and I just don't care about Cuba. You know, I don't care. It's not in our interest. It's not our problem. And the people who are stirring up the revolt are, you know, the real problem. Like the globalist American empire is the real problem, not Cuba, not communism. That doesn't matter anymore. And but they're allowing these quote unquote, you know, revolutionaries and dissidents in Cuba on social media. And they allow them throughout the third world, but they don't allow dissidents from the West on there because that's not the intended purpose of social media. It's to, uh, you know, herd people in to the global ideology. That's what, that's like the intended purpose. The problem is, is, you know, people are able to counteract that and to jam the system and to gain a popularity on there because, and that's why Nick and others who've been banned were, were, were very popular on the platform. And that's why they're banned. So going, well, you know, what is the future of Nick is, you know, some people are like, is this going to end him or, you know, whatever. I, I don't think that's the case. I mean, one of the good things that we have is that we do have alternative platforms. They're not necessarily perfect replacements for the, <clears throat> the big tech platforms like YouTube and Twitter. But they are there and you can still amass a large audience and you can still communicate with people. And, you know, that's where you find it. And Nick has been deplatformed for, you know, seriously deplatformed for, you know, two or three years. So he's been moving to these alternatives like he's been banned from YouTube for, you know, a year and a half now, I believe. I think he was banned in early 2020 and his audience, you know, went with him from both DLive and then to his own website. I'm pretty sure he still gets roughly 10,000 live K, you know, 10,000 live streamers, people will tune in every night. At least uh, he's got over 40,000 followers on tele Telegram. That's a lot. He's got over 70,000 on Gab. So he's still able to get his message out to the public. <clears throat> I don't think he's going to have the situation which happened with uh, Stefan Molyneux. That was probably one of the worst D platforms because he was first banned from uh, YouTube and then he was banned, and then the next day he was banned from Twitter. And uh, this might be the first time you've been hearing about Stefan Molyneux in the last two years, because most people have not heard about him at all since that ban happened, and he just evaporated. And when his ban occurred, like very little attention was paid to it. In contrast to when Nick was banned, you know, the New York Times covered it. Uh, so I think he's still going to be a force out there. He's, you know, they can't silence him. He's still on Telegram, still on Gab. Still got his own website, still charging along, still doing events in real life, still holding events. And so he's going to carry on. It'll, you know, it'll be different. You know, there'll be, you know, possibly some limitations, but, you know, they can't silence you. They can't stamp you out. As long as you have like a dedicated fan base, they'll go with you wherever you go. So we do. And it is a, it is a fortunate thing uncompared to 2016, 2017, 2018. You know, these alternative platforms have better developed uh, and so you do you're still able to get your voice out there much more uh, much more effectively than you were three or four years ago so that's something the white pill to keep in mind i don't think you know the twitter bans are probably gonna get worse i don't know if we're gonna be allowed i feel that like by 2024 a lot of us aren't gonna be allowed on twitter anymore but i think also by 2024 uh twitter won't have its grasp on the American society that it does now or did really did before. I think there will be new alternatives afoot. You know, we'll still be able to get our voice out there. Uh, they can't silence us. That's then that's my final that's my parting message on that. And hopefully you get white pilled about it. Don't be black pilled about uh, the bands because we can still carry on on alternative platforms and it cannot silence us. Before I move into the Christianity topic, I want to get into something that I wasn't planning on talking about today, but I decided to because of, of course, a Twitter exchange. <laughs> this actually dates from Saturday, but I saw a tweet that I was like, I have to respond to this, of course. I don't want to get too much into the Twitter details, but what happened with is Amy Therese went on this uh, 
uh, on this. We like Amy Therese. T- uh, she's not been on the show before, but I think we'll, she'll be on uh, soon enough. And we like Amy Therese, but people are able to have disagreements, of course. And she was saying, she's been saying a lot of the stuff. was like, you guys don't need to play the race game. The only way to win is to not play. And it's like conservatives have been playing for uh, too long and they've been losing the race game. The only way you can... Uh, when is being the left and I just simply pointed out like conservatives have been playing uh, have not been playing the race game for at least 50 years and they're not winning and she uh, then made a point that amounted to Democrats are the real racists and uh, that that's her that's her opinion and so well but I don't want to go too much into what Amy Theresa is saying I want to really want to go into this point where de- conservatives and Republicans have not been playing the race issue for 50 years there were some people from the wake nat circles who then jumped on and was like oh no the the GOP has been race baiting for 50 years read the southern strategy you have to get this and there's this guy uh, I got a discussion with I don't know who he really is but he had a very limited grasp of knowledge and I simply said, if you believe that the Republicans have been built on race baiting, you've watched too much MSNBC, and it's true. And I, whenever you watch MSNBC and they look into Republican historical strategies, they always bring up the this comment by Lee Atwater, who is a top Republican strategist. He worked on the Reagan and George H. W. Bush's campaign. He was like the campaign manager, the lead campaign guy for George H. W. Bush in 1988. He died before the 1992 election due to cancer. Um, the famous figure. He's kind of a loathsome individual, actually. But he gave this interview where he said, you know, Republicans. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, you know, conservatives in the 50s, 60s, we'd say the N-word, you know, we'd say, it, but now we can say that, and then we moved on to schools, and but now we can't really, we're moved on to now, like, taxes and small government. And this this comment is played all the time by the, uh, by the mainstream, by liberals. They're like, ha-ha, we found the secret to Republican strategy. It's all racism. And any time I went on Tom Hartman's RT show... Um, back in the mid 2010s, I always used to go on there when I worked at the at the caller. He would play that clip every other time I went on there. It's like, oh, here we go. It's a Lee Atwater clip. This is like common knowledge. And then they have the Lee Atwater clip, him just saying that and outlining the strategy. And then they have the Willie Horton ad. Uh, that's it to prove the Republican race baiting. So two things for the 1980s that aren't necessarily accurate or representative of what Republicans were campaigning on is seen as the race baiting strategy. And this guy also like decided to, you know, ex- move the goalposts on a strategy and say that like, oh, them pace, pass- passing race-based legislation that benefits non-whites is somehow that's showing that they played race and like this showed the monoparty. It was just like a weird argument that like is totally buried in semantics and is just uh, it's somebody trying to be feel that they're smarter than they actually are. Uh, I don't think that's really worth because the ultimate point is like something unimportant and minutia that it just doesn't matter. But what you have to look at Republicans from the 70s onwards it, and in several of the conservative movements that are around them, some of them initially were built around racial issues. I mean, busing was a huge issue in the 70s. And initially, the school choice matter, the original school choice and the development of private schools and, and government and government uh, subsidies for private schools was built around the segregation, uh, segregation and integration issue. And many of these academies, private Christian academies, were founded in order to give white kids, you know, who are going to be uh, swamped by, you know, diversity, you know, a chance to move over. And that's why they they started these academies. And actually, the religious right was started over a fight over Bob Jones University being forced to integrate. And do and this was a huge issue for not just Bob Jones University, which is a big evangelical uh, school. It was an issue for private schools um, throughout the South and really throughout the country. Is that you know whether they're going to lose their right to determine who's allowed to attend their school. And that became their defining issue, but they moved on to abortion afterwards. And even the school choice issue became uh, deracialized over time. And and busing, you know, the right actually did do a pretty good job against busing. That is like uh, something that, you know, one minor victory. They did, you know, stop the mass uh, imposition of busing. There were some limitations on it. Uh, through the 70s, but by the 80s, you know, none of the, most of these issues weren't around. And whenever Ronald Reagan campaigned, he campaigned 
on straight non-racial issues. You know, he wasn't campaigning on eliminating the Civil Rights Act. He was campaigning on supply side economics and low taxes and, uh, you know, and like hardcore anti-communism and we'll stick it to the Reds. And even when I was reading Rick Perlstein's book and Rick Perlstein, you know, I wrote an article about this for Revolver a couple of months ago and I talked about it on the show is that when he looked at the campaign, and Rick Perlstein's also the source for many of these uh, arguments that the Republicans have, have been built on race baiting for, for since the 60s. You know, and he, even when he looked at Reagan's campaign in 1980, there were, in the whole book, which is like desperate to point out racial angles, you couldn't find any racial angles, but he still concludes that like R Reagan's campaign was built all about on appeals to a sense of white victimhood and a sense of, whites losing their power but there weren't really any clear indications that the, that that was the case and all that reagan was campaigning on is campaigning on open borders and and a uh, north american union that uh, like the european union and, and and global trade and he made this huge pitch to blacks and saying republicans were the real anti-racist party and mar policies are going to benefit blacks and he made a huge push to the minority community throughout his campaigns, both in 80 and 84, and same with H.W. Bush. I mean, H.W. Bush signed the 1990 Immigration Act, which is uh, ultimately, arguably more responsible for our present mass immigration crisis than the 65 Immigration Act because it increased immigration, you know, to an even larger degree. You know, he signed that into law, and none of them did anything about civil rights. And with H.W. Bush and Lee Atwater, who's supposedly the architect of the racist strategy, they're both condemning uh, Pappy Cannon and David Duke as racist. And you're like, where is the race baiting? And the, the, what they'll accuse of race baiting is like them talking about illegal immigrants or them talking about crime or them talking about a affirmative action, which they no longer even talk about and they don't even do anything about. I mean... The other ad that they would talk about is Jesse Helms, who is a senator from North Carolina who opposed the Martin Luther King holiday. In 1990, he ran against a black can candidate, and he had an anti-affirmative action ad where uh, White Hands, that's the name of the White Hands, is a, a sees like a rejection letter from his job, and he crumples it up angrily. And they're like, this is an appeal to racism. There was no real appeal to racism. I mean, it's like... I mean, that's like if that's all you have is the White Hands ad and Willie Horton, there's not much of a case for this. And it's more just that this is a liberal talking point that's been repeated onwards is that most of these haven't been race baiting. And even when they talk about issues that may have something to do with race, it's like illegal immigration or even with critical race theory that we're seeing now, they're at pains to separate it from the race issue. And then they don't deliver. And if you look at their policies, they definitely certainly didn't fight on race when it came to legislation. I mean, in the 80s, they had the opportunity to scrap Civil Rights Act. Instead, they expanded and extended it. Uh, you know, on holidays, they voted for the Martin Luther King holiday and Juneteenth. Uh, you know, they passed amnesty in 1986. You know, they have not, they even their offer, they've missed their opportunities to eliminate affirmative action and eliminate birthright citizenship. So they have not been fighting on the racial, racial issues. And this whole race baiting thing is just a liberal uh, canard that it's not even really smart to believe it. If you actually analyze the facts and overlook like the hand, you know, the two ads that they use to butt rest their argument, you know, there's nothing there. Uh, you know, I'll end this point uh, quickly is that I, this idea has so long been embedded within Democrats and and political disc and, and standard mainstream political commentary is that in 2006, I remember because I was growing up in Tennessee, um, Bob Corker was running against uh, <laughs> a member of the uh, the Ford family, not like the Henry Ford, but uh, the Ford uh, Ford family, which is this big black um, powerful family from. Uh, Memphis, and he ran this ad saying that the guy he was running against, Harold Ford Jr., you know, had attended. He ran this ad where it's like, oh, look at all these terrible things that he's done. And he had one where he attended a, a party at the Playboy Mansion, and there was a white woman there who was supposed to portray like one of the playmates he may have made. And at the end of this ad, you know, they're going through mocking Harold Ford, and he's like a light skinned black guy, Harold Ford. And and by, and to emphasize, this is the tenant, U.S. Senate race in Tennessee in 2006. She says, hey, Harold, call me. And MSNBC thought this was the most racist ad 
in human history. They're like, this is an appeal to the Klan. They're they're trying to lynch Harold Ford Jr. This is like awful, like this racial dynamics that they're playing. And even when I was watching that, and then like even with my family, you know, nobody picked up the racial angle. Like we don't get the racial. <laughs> it's just like him, just like showing he's like a scummy politician who's like sleeping around. And yeah, it is like a white woman, but I don't even think the people who made that ad necessarily understood the racial dynamics even though it was a little bit different 15 years ago they definitely didn't get it but they just saw that like tennessee south uh, ad against a black candidate this must be the part of the gop's race baiting strategy when it was like a stupid ad that like was just attacking him for being a sleazy politician and they simply thought that there was like some hidden racial meaning there and like bob corker of course like disavowed the ad it was like done by some like uh like political pack that wasn't uh, directly tied to the campaign. So, you know, don't fall necessarily for MSCB talking points. You need to look into this, uh, in fact. And and anyway, it doesn't really help our cause to say, like, they have been fighting on race and race baiting. They, uh, but they they don't deliver. You know, yeah, the, we all know this. Um, we want the GOP to move more in our direction. But they don't necessarily, it, they're afraid, they're still afraid of race. They don't race bait. This is just something that people like that write for the New York Times and set the discourse on MSNBC belief. And it's not necessarily true, especially if you look at the facts and look at the actual what George H.W. Bush, Ronald Reagan, George W. Bush especially ran on and they ran on appeals to non-whites and were desperate to be seen as anti-racist. And these race baiting, you know, charges are just drummed up by Democrats and liberals and it's not even smart political commentary. It's just not true. So I want to get into that. We're now at the 41 minute mark and I still haven't gotten to what was supposed to be the only topic today, but I'll get into that right now. So last week I had this tweet where I said, there's no bigger gap between Twitter and real life than the American Catholic experience. And what I meant by this, and so there were some you know, valid uh, critiques of that. And some people were saying, well, you know, this is a primary assessment of Catholic Twitter. And if you see Catholic Twitter, it's filled with trads who you know, are returning to the traditional liturgy. They want Latin masses. They want a stricter observance of the catechism. This is what they believe is the new trend. And this is what they believe is, many of them say, is the, the trend among young people. And then if you look at the polling and the data on this and a lot of like the ground level stuff, and even if you meet like real life, a lot of real life young Catholics, you see a, a, quite a different picture. Now, some people there were, as I was saying, you know, there were some valid critiques and saying, well, there are the like normie libtard Catholics are well represented in Catholic Twitter. And, and some people are like that. But if you look at the standard discourse, it is mostly centered around trads. It's set by trads. You would think that this is a major force within the Catholic Church, which is not saying that it's not. I mean, there is, it is, you know, there is a sizable element in it, but it's not as large as you would believe from Twitter. And I think people who are not coming, who are not, you know, were, weren't raised in the American Catholic Church, who were not, you know, don't know that many people around it, and most of the people they just see is on Twitter, they would have a incorrect vision of what the American Catholic experience is. So I just decided to show some data on what, you know, what's going on in the Catholic Church and whether it is going into this trad renaissance. And this is not so much as like an attack on, on the Catholic Church. And I'm not saying like, you know, you know, I'm not trying to pick on Catholics or anything or particularly not trads. And I think that for the most part, you know, trad movement, I think, think among uh, people who are not in dc new york city uh is mostly positive i think it is it is people who are wanting to re you know return to traditions and to you know an authentic community and they want to they you know they're inspired by the mass so we're not going to not going to try to pick on those people but i think it's just that you know you need a realistic assessment of what the church is like and where where are the trends going because, I mean, I've, as long as I've been around, you know, actively involved in politics, I've heard this, you know, theme constantly over time is that young people want the traditional liturgy. And this is not just in, you know, a stricter conservative observance rather than, you know, and it's the boomers who are wanting the, the changes and the, and the libtardism. It's uh, that's not necessarily the case. I, there was an article that American conservative loves this article because they always tweet it out. It's from like early 2014. And it's saying that young people, millennials are turning to the traditional liturgy. 
And I've, I think I've read this article when it was published in 2014, and I've read it like once or twice since then, whenever they'll see it. And there is not one data point to show that millennials are returning to liturgy. It's simply just this person who is involved in D.C. conservatism saying that, like, my friends are returning to, to traditional liturgy. This must mean that millennial, that this is a millennial-wide movement, that this is a millennial-wide phenomenon. And uh, it's not quite that. So I'll go, I'm going to go read read through some of the data points I brought up last week in order to say, you know, give a picture of what the American Catholic experience is like. So the first data point is uh, young American Catholics overwhelmingly accepting of homosexuality, which would, you know, contra contradict some of the arguments saying that young Catholics are moving in the direction of a stricter observance of the catechism. Uh, the other points is uh, looking at who are switching and this is a point that some of these people were saying is that protestantism is dying out and you know it's really catholicism that's growing and there's not that many people leaving the church and some people were making this argument that whenever you point out data points they're saying well these aren't real catholics but then they would cite about how 22 percent of the population is still catholic and there's been no leaving at all and there's this is like showing how strong the faith is so people couldn't decide on what the faith is but if you look at the figures of like people who are leaving is that catholics have the largest number of people who are leaving the church uh compared to you know evangelicals have more people have slightly more people joining the church and it's the same with even some and even with mainline protestants it's 1.7 people leaving versus to one person joining which is a pretty good figures with catholics it's 6.5 people leaving versus one person joining uh you know in the figures and that's a massive, massive, uh, you know, departure from the church. And many of these people will still identify as, and some of these people will identify, still identify as Catholic, even though, or, uh, so there is this large gap, or they're moving into the unaffiliated or saying that they're agnostic or, or, or atheist. And most of these people are um, white, whites themselves. Uh, and there was this argument saying that like, because I said the argument, the reason why the Catholic Church maintains a 22% percentage of the American population is due to mass immigration. Uh, all these people would argue, no, it's not. It's, it's, they're leaving the church. It's actually whites who are staying. And then it's like, you know, well, I guess mass immigration hasn't happened in the last 20 years. Uh, I guess they have not contributed. But it is, you know, there are, people pointed out that there are, a smaller percentage of Hispanics who are Catholic. It's a plurality. It's I believe it's like 48, 47 percent of Hispanics uh, living in America are Catholic versus it was like 58 or 57 percent in the early 2000s. And it's a smaller number, but there are more Hispanic Catholics in America today than there were in 2003. And that's what makes up, you know, that's what explains the difference. And that's why they're still dependent on the reason why it stayed at 22% while Protestantism has declined is because we're having more mass immigration from Latin America and from Asian Catholics and from African Catholics. And there's not that many Protestants that we're experiencing mass immigration from. So that's the one the difference. So that's one thing that you keep in mind is that like saying, well, it's like we're keeping more people in the church and it's, um, you know, those figures aren't playing out. And then it's the saying, it's like, you know, do Catholics actually want demand that the church become uh, you know, greater, stricter observance. And I want to point that some of this, this, some of the polling does include people who are quote unquote cultural Catholics or ex Catholics, but it does, they do support a growing liberalization of the church. So here's numbers 76% <clears throat> of Catholics believe that, uh, that the church should allow Catholics to use birth control, and only 8% of Catholics believe that. Uh, birth control is morally wrong and even among regularly church attending catholics that number is only 13 percent and the church is unambiguous in being in condemning birth control it is there is no um there is no gray area about that the church is very clear on this matter uh 62 percent believe priests should get married 62 percent also believe allow that divorced catholics who remarry without getting an annulment should receive communion i think i would surprise that's not even a higher number um, but allow cohabit cohabiting Catholics to receive communion. That's 61%. 59% believe that uh, women should become priests. 
And 46% believe that the Catholic Church should recognize marriages between gay and lesbian couples. And now this, these numbers are from 2015. So we can imagine that the numbers are probably a lot, especially on the gay marriage number, those should be a lot higher because this poll was actually taken May 5th to June 7th, 2015. That's before the Supreme Court legalized gay marriage, right before the Supreme Court legalized gay marriage. So that is a massive, uh, there's been a massive shift on gay marriage ever since that time. So I would imagine that it's now a majority. Uh, how big of a majority? You know, we don't know. So that's one thing to keep. And it's also, there's facts about, you know, some of these facts that I pointed out, I don't know, I think it might be a little bit too much picking on, uh, such as like uh, the difference between Catholic school kids and um, Protestant school kids. But I would say that like the studies, this is does come from 1997. Maybe there is some difference, but uh, kids who go to Catholic school are far more likely to engage in sex and drugs than, and not attend church services than those who go to Protestant schools. And I think even if you go in to look, and one thing is that some people, uh, some of these tribes are saying that Catholics are more devout than Protestants, uh, even, even evangelical Protestants. Uh, and that's also not true, which is like a vast majority of evangelical Protestants say that religion is far, religion is far more important to their life than Catholics do. And they also say that they pray more regularly than Catholics do. Uh, so that's the best way of saying, you know, devotion. And this is not, I don't want to, once again, not saying picking on uh, Catholics, but these are the things. And then when they say that, like, a cat, white Catholics form the basis of the conservative movement, I think, you know, white Catholics are overrepresented in the activists. That's certainly true, especially when it comes, you know, not even within our own sphere, but if you look at the pro-life movement, and even conservative, you know, right, white Catholics are, of course, uh, without them, uh, we probably wouldn't have a conservative movement, maybe for better or for worse, or we certainly wouldn't have a nationalist movement, or we certainly wouldn't have a pro-life movement. But even among voters, uh, evangelicals, white evangelicals went for Trump like by almost 80%. It was like close to that. And then even among white mainline Protestants, it was a slight slight uh slightly more of them voted for trump than white catholics it was like 53 percent uh white mainliners versus 52 percent white catholics um yeah so those are the numbers that are going with that and i think a lot of people like you know are very down on protestants because they look at like the outward trappings of some of these terrible churches like the episcopalians and the unitarians and they see oh this they're you know they're they're just totally destroyed and for whatever for whatever reason you know those people are the core base of the reactionary base especially white evangelicals are the core base of of reactionary politics in america and even among religious groups is that white evangelicals were the only ones to a majority of them oppose black lives matter and oppose a mass immigration they're one of the few it's uh, there's a poll that's found that two-thirds of white evangelicals felt that immigrants are invading the country it was roughly at 50 percent of catholics i was trying to find the poll where it's saying it's like if immigration is a net negative for the country and white evangelicals were shown as the only ones to believe that as a majority uh, and they're also one of the few groups that were they find that there is no racial incidence uh that you know, there is no such thing as police racism and et cetera. Their views are very, it's like even, you know, regardless of their religious or theological views, but white evangelicals are more likely to hold uh, right wing cultural issues and right and right wing identity issues much more so than white Catholics and uh, certainly more than white mainliners and even white mainliners in some of these polls outperform Catholics. So white Catholics. So there's something to keep in mind there where people think that you know, it's like the white Catholics are the only hope uh, for America. And then like this is the reactionary base and it's shown that it's white evangelicals, which is why you not, not necessarily should pick on uh, the poor old evangelicals. I think it's very easy to pick on them because, I mean, some of them have some goofy beliefs and maybe and certainly the larger culture itself demonizes white evangelicals more so than they do white Catholics, even though the, obviously Catholics aren't are uh, particularly conservative Catholics aren't liked by the mainstream culture you know they definitely prefer to pick on uh, they certainly demonize evangelicals a little bit more 
So I, I don't think people should get in that trappings. So that just, just shows like the, you know, where it is in, you know, among American politics of like who, what is like the American Catholic experience. And even just from my own experience, it's like, uh, I think that some of the listeners know this, but I was raised Catholic. I'm a confirmed Catholic. Catholic Church still says I'm a member, I guess. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I would guess I'd be in the category that's lapsed, but they, even from my experience when I'm growing up, it's, you know, I didn't really... And this is for most Catholics who grow up in the in the Catholic schools, go to CCD, and they you know they're supposedly taught the catechism through CCD and through their priests. Is that the, you know they don't really understand? There's not a really good taught about the faith, but in many ways, their experience is more accurate to what the American Catholic experience is. And all these people, and it's like very common among Catholic Twitter to mock and dunk people you know there will be some liberal woman who'll be like i was raised i went to a catholic school and let me tell you about catholicism and people always mock that because they're like this is the first argument that this person doesn't know what they're saying but there is a point to that that that's like that experience does articulate what the average catholic views as as their faith and it's not necessarily you know these deep dives into the theology of thomas aquinas and it's not, you know, really understanding what most papal encyclicals are. It's simply this cultural, you know, cultural tradition that's transmitted by the Catholic schools and CCD. And you can argue that that's, they're not doing a very good job of that. I, I, I would understand that. But that is like the experience. And even with that and like within my family, it's like I could not like I didn't find out that until I was an adult that you had to you know, uh, go to confession regularly in order to receive communion. That was like, what? I was not taught that <laughs> as a kid, and even though that's a very basic tenet of the faith. Uh, I would also say is that a lot of most Catholics aren't aware that, you know, not following Lent uh, dietary practices and you know, like, you know, such as eating meat on Fridays, uh, the prescribed meat on Fridays, uh, you know, is a mortal sin. Most of them would have would not know that and be like, "What, really? <laughs> That's a mortal sin." They would not know that a lot of these things that they would see as minor offenses are not even offenses at all. Would be mortal sins according to the catechism. Most of these people are, don't aware of this, and even within my family, I think this is very common within a lot of Catholic families. Is that it's not seen as particularly masculine to be. Uh, really, really devoted to the faith uh, in a way. It's, I have a funny story is that my uncle, one of my uncles likes to tell me this. this is, he's married to my uh, one of my dad's sisters, so he's not necessarily blood related. I, I don't know if that's necessarily important, but it's just something to keep in mind. Is they were raised Catholic, and they love telling this story about you know when the kids, his kids were really young, he would go out and play golf and hang out with his friends on every Sunday. Uh, but he was eventually caught by his own son. His son, you know, the the aunt is like getting everyone ready to go to church, and the son says, uh, "But dad, but da I don't. But dad tells me church isn't for boys <laughs> because he was relying on the fact that his my uncle like was going out and playing golf on Sunday instead of going to church. And then he <laughs> afterwards, of course, the uncle began going to church <laughs> with the family. Uh, so." Uh, I don't, I don't even know. I, I think they were working different schedules. I believe that aunt was working as a nurse at the time. So uh, that may have been the schedule that like he was the father was supposed to take the kids to church and wasn't doing so. But <laughs> I forget the an exact reason why, but it was a part of the joke. And that is like a very common, even with kids I knew from Catholic school, is that they the like kind of the really the faith practices that are really emphasized by Catholic Twitter, it would be something come off as very foreign to them. Uh, even though maybe they had, you know, and even though they knew some women who were practicing the rosary and praying the rosary and stuff. And I know people from Catholic schools who were like that. That was something that a lot of the guys did not do. That was something that uh, it was more of something for the girls who were going there who were praying the rosary. Uh, some of the friends, many of the friends who, uh, who went to Catholic church or Catholic school told me this. And even I almost went to Catholic school, but um, so... Some of that, is, so some of these practices that you would see, a lot of it is, um, you know, not what really is uh, 
appealing to definitely the large swath of American Catholics. And even the, the thing you have to realize is that also, even from my experience of like meeting young Catholics and meeting people within my own family, uh, large extended family, is that they enjoy the guitar masses, which is, uh, which I never liked, uh, but they really enjoy the guitar masses. And if they were really told like the type of faith was imposed upon them, the, like groups like church militant and others have, they would leave the church. They would just go to a Protestant church if they had that imposed on them, because it would be something like, oh, this is very strange, like getting on your knees and taking it on the tongue, uh, communion on the tongue. Uh, that was something that, you know, even in my, like, my experience, that is something that is uh, very strange to most people I knew who were growing up in Catholic and nobody I knew. You know, like that argument over whether you're supposed to take it on the tongue or not, or, it, you know, it's put in your hand, you're put in, put in your mouth. I remember my, one of my CCD teachers was talking about how weird it was that they saw somebody who took, uh, took it in their mouth. And that's like, well, and for me, I didn't realize that that was like common practice for, for hundreds of years within the Catholic Church. And these were being, and I was being taught by boomer parents at that time. So, you know, this is, it's all something to just keep in mind when you're talking about the church and what its practices are and where it's going. And even when it's talking about, you know, the youth are returning to traditional liturgy and the traditional church traditions. That's not carried out by polls in, in itself. And I retweeted a, another poll a few days after a tweet about the American Catholic experience where it's showing that, uh, you know, it's about a little over 60 percent of boomers and Gen Xers are firmly believe without a doubt that there is a God. But among millennials and Gen Z, it's among uh, millennials, it's hovering around 50 percent. And then among <laughs> Gen Z, it's down to 30% who believe that. And you have to, you know, and among the older generations, there's a much more fervent belief in, uh, in that, there is an, that there is a God. There is certain without a doubt. But this doubt is beginning to spread much more in the young youth. And maybe that's due to the culture. Well, it's, it's not due to the culture. It's obviously due to the culture. It's not a probably. And I think if you even looked more into the numbers, a, unfortunately, the fact I think it would be higher among whites where the where the doubt is rising. And even if you look at atheists and agnostic numbers, I mean, atheist people who openly describe themselves as atheists and agnostics are one of the most definably liberal groups in this country. You can always understand that they're going to take a very far left position. So I'm not necessarily saying that it's not necessarily good if like. Atheists and agnostics are you need to win them over when they're like this libtard group uh, But at the same time you have to realize that there is the even among the religious or people who say they're Christian and Catholic There is a trend away from traditional theology and teachings and even among um, a lot of people who are self-described Christian I would say if you go up to the average one especially you know particularly if they're young Catholics and they're saying that the church needs to become more accepting of homosexuality they're not calling for return to the strict observance of the catechism that everyone needs to be imposed in this and they want mantillas and other other uh, accoutrements of the traditional mass so with all this, now that this is not saying that like you shouldn't join, and I want to point this out in the fact, and people are true, that there are more people who are attending Latin Mass than ever before. I mean, well, I mean, the height of it, of course, was the early 60s, where the Latin Mass was the only Mass. So, <laughs> uh, I mean, since the disappearance of the Latin Mass in the 60s, there's probably far more people attending Latin Mass, and all these ch traditional churches are growing. I, I am aware of that, but you have to consider is that where this segment is and people would say, well, you need the, there needs to be a separate category for traditional Catholics. The a group did a study on traditional Catholics, and this is a traditional Catholic group that was trying to show that traditional Catholics are more um, observant and more dedicated to the real beliefs of the church, which they, of course, proved. They found that there, they estimated that there's at least 100,000 traditional Catholics in America. And this is a 2019 study. People said that, like, oh, over the last three years, it must have uh, gone up to over a million, uh, maybe two million. I don't know if there's necessarily if that's true. It maybe it probably did go up. So maybe there might be 150,000 or 200,000 Catholics, uh, traditional Catholics. But even among the larger population, there are 70 million Catholics in America 
this is a small percentage of them. It is growing. It can, you know, maybe over, you know, 50 years, it might be, you know, a like a, a real sizable force within, you know, or a, a big part of the church. But at the moment, it's that's not where it's at. I mean, it is, and compared to some, I mean, you know, it's about the size of, you know, one of the smaller but stable Protestant denominations. It's probably about the same size as the Anglican dissonance. The Anglican dissonance, uh, people have left from the Episcopalian Church and call themselves Anglicans. That's also about, uh, you know, roughly at least 100,000 people. So it's, uh, they're about equal to that. And that's a, that's a sizable group compared to um, a lot of other religions that are out there. <laughs> you know, there's some religions that are very small. Uh, so it, it is it is growing in force. But I also want to say is that some people... You know, mainly what this argument is, it's not me picking on Catholics or just saying it. It's more, uh, you know, wanting people to realize where the church is at the moment and what it's going to act like and how what the average Catholic is. And when you see people arguing that, like, I grew up in Catholic school or I went to Catholic school, I can tell you about Catholicism. Yes, they're being stupid, but they're ultimately representing what the average American Catholic experience is. It's much more, their experience is much more uh, common and much more, you know, much more indicative of what the average American Catholic experience is. Experience is then necessarily, you know, uh, Latin Crusader um, 10, <laughs> uh, 1099, you know, that is, uh, that, you know, they're not necessarily, they would not know what Deus Volt means. And that has an important matter when it comes to the church serving as this bulwark against liberalism. You know, there's some disagreements of whether, you know, the laity or the priests or the bishops should, you know, be in control. And a lot of the traditional elements, some, I, I know that there's a, a lot of integralists who like to use this argument. There is some truth to it, but it, they do some ways emulate uh, evangelical and Protestant denominations that, that they want greater laity control our greater laity influence but really the church reforms always have to come from the clergy it can't it really doesn't come from the laity that is what it is i don't know if that's that's not really a positive or negative thing that's uh that's just how it is and so th there's always these integralist arguments that they're trying to insert more laity la lady control of the church but but in the direction of making it more conservative but if you did give it more laity control or if they were more open to it they would actually be in a lot of ways worse, especially when it came to uh, gay issues and birth, and birth control and abortion. Due to the fact that it's controlled by the clergy, you can understand that even, even with some of the Pope's recent comments about gays and even some, you know, some of his like appeals to the left, the church as like one of the major, major Christian institutions is going to be reliably consistent on traditional Christian teaching about gays about homosexuality and about abortion than any other church due to the fact that it's, you know, controlled by the clergy. It's not, you know, that is one factor I want to give it to the Catholics. And, it, and even when it comes to Black Lives Matter stuff, I think the church doesn't, compared to a lot of Protestant denominations, even even conservative ones, it's less, um, it, less comfortable with going full in on Black Lives Matter theology. And I don't think it's going to fully accept it either because... Even the even though it's growing in force in Africa, uh, the Africans aren't necessarily <laughs> coming down, uh, aren't really fully understanding what Black Lives Matter is. So I don't think I think that's one thing that's going for the church. But when it comes to this factor of providing resistance to liberalism and being, you know, the last stand is like the state, you know, the liberal state is going to have to fear the church. It's not that's not really carried out in, in practice due to and it's due to a lot of these laity who are, you know, not well catechized. I guess that'd be the term. And they're the ones like saying, I went to Catholic school. Let me tell you about the real Catholic experience, though. It's because a lot of do is do that laity and they know they don't want to offend it. And many Catholics were laughing about it, all these Catholics saying, I'm going to leave the church if they, you know, condemn Biden. You know, there probably is a fair number of church go regular churchgoers who are in that category. I don't know if they may. They're probably not the majority. They might, even, they might be pretty small, but there is like a fair number of Catholics who do believe this. And due to winning, having to keep that, you know, uh, lackadaisical uh, laity in, in within the church, that is one of the reasons that 
it's not necessarily going to go full board base reactionary and calling for a crusade. And we can even see this in Canada, where which I pointed out last week is, you know, all these churches are burning down. I think it's now up to it's almost nearly to 20. I think the last number I saw was 17 that has been burned. And there's been and there's been dozens more that have been vandalized. You know, the church is under attack. You know, this is a perfect opportunity to you know, condemn, you know, the Trudeau government and the liberal for secular forces for not doing anything to protect their church and to fight back against this blood libel against them. And what is the church doing? It's uh, Pope Francis is setting up a meeting to apologize to the indigenous leaders uh, who are fermenting the uh, church arsons. So <laughs> that's that's really the church's response. If you know, even if it's under attack, it chooses the path of submission to the the forces that actually determine morality in our society and it's not the church it's these secular institutions like you know the universities the media and others that set the morality for our western societies it's not the church and the church has to accommodate that arrangement i, I think the the real impetus for this is i've just seen such bad analysis and it's mostly from mainstream conservatives who would just like emphasize like there is a figure a very you know important figure within pocket the sink who i just won't name but in a private conversation with a friend he said that you know he was convinced that the zoomers are returning to traditional catholicism and a lot of zoomers are turning into this and it's i mean compared with you know 20 or 30 years ago i mean there is a trend you can see online where these people are getting into it but it's not reflective of the generation itself and I think people, you know, they they can understand that there are there are a fair number of young people who are joining in and are going to these traditional Latin masses, but that is not representative of the generation itself. And there's all these, and particularly American conservatives had such bad analysis after the sex uh, sex abuse scandal, where they were predicting, due to what they were seeing on Twitter, that there was going to be a schism uh, within the church, that they were going to, you know, throw give these pedophile priests, you know, throw millstones around them and throw them into rivers. And there was going to be this cleaning of the house and none of that occurred. And many of these commentators were convinced of that by what they were seeing on Twitter. And I think the for the average lady, you know, they were aware of the sex abuse scandal, but they weren't necessarily, um, you know, wanting a schism or they were not calling for these extreme measures that you would think that, you know, Catholic media people on Twitter were were obsessed with that that wasn't getting connected with the average rank and file in the church. The other point is that, yes, traditionalist Catholics are an important part of the right wing base, and so are white Catholics themselves. But the real like voters and like the real foot soldiers are more white evangelicals. And it's and evangelicalism is not dying. And like some people have always predicted like Protestantism is on its way out, even though there is you know, a decline in membership, even conservative denominations like the Southern Baptist Church or Southern Baptist Convention, rather, they're still going strong. And if you even go to an average evangelical mass, even among young people who are wanting to find a faith, they're more likely to attend a evangelical service. Even if you go to I've been a few recently and I'll go to some of these uh you know, it's like full on folk and rock music the whole time. It's a little, it's a little much, but there's like all young people there. And a lot of young people, even if they're like have conservative beliefs, they really like that stuff. And, you know, it is something to keep in mind when like, you know, they're published as articles is that they're all these young people are turning to traditional liturgy. It's primarily the people are writing it is, you know, people who are members of America's intelligentsia and like, Catholic traditional Catholicism and Orthodoxy are more appealing than you know Pentecostalism and evangelical Christianity, and that's why. And they see that their friends are joining this, and they see other people, and they're like, "Oh, there's a bunch of young people here. This must be a trend among all young people." And that's not necessarily the case. So some of this, is, some of the arguments that I'm making is like, "Well, actually, you know, this is what it is," and I, that's not necessarily, you know criticizing people for the beliefs or whatever or condemning them or telling them to change their faith. I think that's a matter up to you. And I'm not trying to pick on Catholics. I just see that there are just so much bad analysis and bad, um, uh, you know, not accurate observations of what we're going on. I always remember is like in the, in the, in talking about how for every one Catholic joining the church, there's 6.5 leaving. I do remember that there was somebody who, who confidently told me that for every one person who's leaving the church, four 
are turning, we're jo joining a traditional congregational, and <laughs> that's that's unfortunately not the case. So I think it's just that people need a, a you know awareness of what it is, and I think even among the right, you know, it is going to be an ecumenical movement. It's going to have many people involved. Of you know, it's going to be predominantly Christian, of course. Uh, but, you know, there's probably going to be a roughly equal number of Catholics and Protestants and people shouldn't uh, be picking on each other for their faiths. And I think you also in the time that you cannot necessarily rely on these Christian institutions to support you or act as a rallying bulwark against liberalism because ultimately they have to submit to the higher powers in our society. And that's the secular authority. And we see this with the Canadian church arsons where the Catholic church is offering no resistance and it's going up and apologizing to the indigenous leaders. We see this, we see this time and time again, when it comes to the American Catholic church, you know, when gay marriage, like they no longer talk about gay marriage anymore. And they're trying to maintain a position that's not overly critical of gays and they will punish priests who get a little too conservative or right wing there's this uh, priest in wisconsin who was almost effectively defrocked i mean he was poor and like put in priest jail like he's he was taken away from his ministry and he's not allowed to uh, he, they put him into like uh, some convent of some sort and they're basically he needs to do penance for you know like a few months to show he can return to the church and this is just because he was doing videos that were you know very conservative and issuing a strong a strong right-wing message and that's what the church does and you know is is what he was saying was theologically consistent with what the church's traditional teachings but they punished him for it uh, so you know you have to consider as like what the church is going to operate as and how it you know when you're looking at the average American Catholic experience, there is a major gap between what you see on Twitter, where people think, you know, that they're, you know, it's, you know, we're on a verge of a new crusade versus the average life where the American Catholic is unaware that they're not supposed to eat meat on, during, on Fridays during Lent, uh, you know, <laughs> and, <laughs> or that they're supposed to go to confession before they take communion. You know, these are some of the things that are, uh, this is a part of the American, American Catholic experience. And now you can say that, like, the course needs to be better catechism and there needs to be serious reforms. And, and yeah, I can understand that. But, you know, that's going to take a long, long time. And you would see a lot of these people. I don't know necessarily that you would see people return to the church. You'd see more people leave, which a lot of these people do argue that they'd rather have a smaller, stronger faith, which, uh, you know, I can understand that point. But you'd have to understand that it's not going to lead to, uh, you know, 100 million American Catholics all going to Latin Mass. You'd probably have a much, much smaller church, which for some people, they would rather have that. And um, I understand that point of view, but that's what would be the result. The final point I want to make is there is this strong connection. Some people were pointing this out is that a lot of people say they're Catholic as like an ethnic, as a way of an ethnic identifier is that their parents were Catholic and their grandparents were Catholic. Even though they may not go to church, they'll still identify as Catholic in a census or a poll. And that shows why there's a change in you know, the, the difference, the differences between Catholic Twitter and, and real life Twitter, and that would account for it. And I do agree with that. But even with the ethnic identifier as a Catholic, it doesn't actually translate into being a, a part of a strong community, even though people will say that they're like Catholic, it is like more of a way of probably more than for Protestants, it is a way of like identifying it's like, I'm a Republican or a Democrat. It's like, but it doesn't necessarily connect them with other people in the way that, uh, you know, specific religious groups. And I just noticed a lot of conservative Catholics in DC are like this, is that when they say Catholic, they want it to mean in the same way that like I'm Jewish and that we're all working together on the same side. We're building our own networks. And there's like favoritism paid towards Catholics. It's operating as like their own ethnic, ethno-religious group. And there are many groups, you know, besides Jews. I mean, most Indians operate like this. Uh, Mormons operate like this, and even uh, some evangelicals operate like this. And from what I'm seeing in D.C., even though Catholics 
are the most consciously trying to do this or want this, it doesn't necessarily operate like this. Like, I don't know anybody, you know, from uh, even my time working DC politics, and I know this is the case in the corporate world, where there's a favoritism towards somebody who's just because, just because they're Catholic in the way that there would be the favoritism for somebody, you know, if somebody's like hiring and that person's Jewish and they know a fellow Jew and they're, they're both Orthodox or they're both reform or they know, they know which synagogue they go to, you know, there's going to be that favoritism towards them. Indians are very much um, even way more involved in this kind of ethnic nepotism where they'll say, oh, it's like an Indian. Oh, of course, we're, we're going to get him hired up. And it's definitely the Mormons operate like this. This is why many people stay in the Mormon church is because there is this close tight knit community that operates as 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 an ethno religious group, which uh, Catholics don't necessarily do at all, uh, for whatever reason. I know there's been all these people who've been uh, in DC who've like consciously want to emulate that that strategy that you know the other groups do, but they it doesn't really work out because it, you know they may there can be some similarities like oh I went to CCD I went to CC you know we both went to CCD they can relate some common experiences, but it doesn't necessarily tr translate into that firm ethno-religious identity that is the same with like you know jews or hindus or mormons and and of course as i'm saying there's people of many different ethnicities and races among mormons but you know what i'm saying uh, cultural maybe cultural religious group maybe is a better way of saying this it doesn't translate with catholics and i ultimately see people fall for this trick because they'll love uh a lot of people were like defending Amy Coney Barrett simply just because she's Catholic. It was like, I'm a Catholic, she's a Catholic, and I'm going to defend her. And this is why she's good because, and it's like an indication that we're both on the same page when, as her, as her record has shown and her by crying over George Floyd, that's not the case. And I think it's, you know, you shouldn't necessarily fall into that with seeing that because the way that American Catholic experience is, you know, there's not much really connecting um american catholics with one another it is like something to say like okay yeah we both attended ccd but there's not this like shared sense of values and a shared sense of like we are in a in a in a tight-knit community together that mormons Hind indians and jews would say and it can't operate like that it's not necessarily the ethnic base for this. And there used to be some more when, you know, there was a growing, you know, some of that used to be the case when there was like a more of an anti-Catholicism in our society and when we were more Protestant and uh, dominated. But that's no longer the case. And I see some people who like pine for that, but it, you know, it doesn't really work. I do think it is a part of our cause to make people like ordinary historic Americans I guess that's the best heritage Americans, Anglo Americans, Native Americans to see themselves as a group and to operate on that basis where they see somebody else as they see, oh, you're one of you're one of us. You're like me. We're a we together. You are you. We share the same beliefs, the same ideas. I see you as a as a fellow, uh, as a fellow part of as a fellow member of my community. And I think that's a larger part of that that we need to do. But that doesn't really work for Catholics in the same way that it does for other groups. Um, so that's something interesting to point out. And I don't think, and I don't think you should. I I, I want people to be wary of of falling into that, especially for right wing, because we've already seen when people did that with Amy Coney Barrett, and they're like, she's one of us. She's a member of my community. And then uh, uh, you get that's what you get. You see her record, and you see her crying over George Floyd. So I don't want people to fall into that trap. So that's my last point about that. We are now at nearing the one hour and 23 minute mark. So this is going to be a long one because I do have a very good cognitive elite question that will, uh, I will devote at least five to 10 minutes on. So buckle in. We still got some time to go. As a reminder, you too can get the power to suggest guests, topics, and questions for highly respected, most importantly questions, if you sign up for the cognitive elite option at highly respected Substack. This one comes from Jack. This is about fraternity, so I'm going to read this in full. He asks, Scott, I just finished No Camps for White Men. He's a few years late, but it's okay. But I really enjoyed it as someone graduating college. I was wondering if your thoughts on fraternities being a viable alternative to the campus insanity still holds. Many, if not all, fraternities showed support for BLM and other leftist social issues. 
And he was, and they talked about some of the fraternities at his house. I don't want to necessarily, uh, uh, once again, um, um, <laughs> dox him, but he's saying that various fraternities at his houses were showing BLM support, uh, and that there was a tax on them for, you know, a, that apparently a fraternity brother said a racial slur without any proof, and they only rush whites. And he was saying, you know, his time in a fraternity uh, was great, but he w wonders, like, what's the future of it? So, uh, you know, still seeing it as a viable alternative. I think one th we have to separate fraternities and sororities. Sororities are compromised. I, I want to say this, like, sororities are just, they're not, even though I think a lot of sorority girls are good and they're... Um, <laughs> for various uh, ways, but I think there are a lot of sorority girls who join are, are pretty conservative, traditional. They're not, uh, they are still joining a group that is different from the campus insanity, but there are so many sorority girls who are fully on board with Black Lives Matter. And I remember there was so much, like last summer I would go on Facebook and I knew these girls in sororities who are just like dumb, drunk thoughts in their time in college. And they had these like paragraph essay length things about screeds about like George Floyd and Black Lives Matter and how much about white privilege. And I was like, dear Lord. And this is a, come on, come on, ma'am. And they were going into this and it's like, yeah, sororities are just, and the national sororities are terrible. Uh, they've kicked out like members who were pro Trump and there's been several cases of like sororities where like a, a member made a pro Trump comment or a criticism of Black Lives Matter and they kicked him out. I, I'm not aware of any fraternities where this occurred and their nationals really encouraged them to and were really went into uh, Black Lives Matter and gay rights stuff. And I think they're even in some sororities they're allowing transgender members now. Um, so there's just a lot of nonsense going on. But even on the local levels, I remember their alumni at my university were really bad. They they always encouraged because they wanted them to be highly rated by nationals. And one of the ways to be highly rated by nationals was to show uh, you know a sufficient level of diversity. So alumni were always encouraging the sororities to give bids to non-whites and some of the non-whites they gave bids to were like uh, there was some like uh, big old magic girls they were giving, <laughs> giving bids to and you're like what is she doing <laughs> this sorority like and they have their i mean and they're they have their own sorority so it was always weird but they were doing this at the behest of their alumni and our alumni were never encouraging our alumni advisors were never encouraging us uh, to do that but even when among fraternities there are certainly libtards in fraternities uh and there's a lot of guys especially a lot of writers who like get involved in media and journalism they later go on into saying that okay yeah my time in fraternity taught me about white privilege and blah 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 whatever I still think those are a minority. If you look at the culture that's encouraged by Old Row, I haven't looked at Total Frat Move recently. I remember Total Frat Move was more libtarded than Old Row. Old Row is very conservative. I actually uh, know some of the people behind it. They're, they're solid Trump supporters. And they encourage like a very right wing thing. They'll always be tweet, you know, they have a bunch of merchandise saying about how much they love Tucker and how they love Trump. And I think, you know, even you can c complain about the differences between that. That's much more better improvement over the political culture that I, when I was in college and in a fr fraternity in the early 2010s, where people thought that Paul Ryan was awesome and they love Ronald Reagan. Now it's like they they translate that to Trump and Tucker, and both Trump and Tucker represent uh, nationalist ideas. So that's what they're, you know, largely supporting. So it is a part of that culture with it but it is ultimately about partying and about social you know enjoying uh your youth and that's what fraternities and stories are about i mean it's not necessarily going to be weaponized into uh, you know a political resistance i mean they're mostly fa focused on partying uh, which isn't the worst thing i don't think that's not a criticism i think if you're you know you're 20 20 21 or you're you know you're around that age it's time to enjoy life you know you're only you only get to be young once and your body can only, you know, is much better at handling hand hangovers and and a lot of the other things that come with uh, partying at that time than you are when you're in your 30s. Uh, so I, I have nothing against that. I think and, and young people have always been like that. They've always needed to get that that other system at that at that age when they're that age. 
And I think fraternities and sororities are, are a great way to do that. Um, but in terms of like acting as resistance, in my book, I think it was more hopeful that they would develop into a more formal political resistance. I wrote my book in 2016, and I have not seen that over the last five years. And I think, well, first, fraternities don't necessarily have that power to do that. I mean, they are a minority on campus. They All the campus leaders want to get rid of them because they're all run by uh, politically correct non-whites and SJW types. They, they're, they're the hot, you know, they're the hated minority on campus. Greek life is, and they have to have a delicate process to ensure that they're not entirely kicked off. And also their primary, you know, focus is socializing and partying. And it's hard to get guys who, you know, joined a fraternity at 19 to, you know, primarily meet girls and have a good time to like, Hey, we need you to be a political soldier now. They're like, I joined to have fun. You know, it's not going to be fun to like go to war with black lives matter on campus. So there is that factor in it, but it does, you know, I don't think it's like an offering a formalized resistance, you know, vehicle. It's not going to do that. But in terms of offering kids a safe space, I guess that's the best way to say that or a, a space free of a lot of the nonsense, that you're going to witness in your classroom and in your dorms and in this in, impose political correctness and black lives matter and, and anti-white racism and indoctrination and woke indoctrination, you know, fraternities are a good place to, you know, be free of that. You're going to meet normal white guys who like to work out, like, you know, like athletic activities, who like, who are, you know, lean conservative. They like Tucker. They like Trump. They're going to probably have the same values as you. And they're not going to, you know, demand that they have a racial quota or, you know, you demand that you check your white privilege or that, you know, it's wrong. You know, we got to end misogyny and stop ending sexist comments. You know, it's allow, it's a, it's a space for you to speak freely, find people of shared values and attitudes and have a good time. And so, and it does, and it also is, it's also good on the matter is that it encourages a type of uh, community-based tribalistic identity that I think a lot of whites don't have. It's like when you're on a college campus, your identity is built around being a part of this fraternity. It's a being a part of this group. It's being a part of this tribe. And that's how you define yourself. And that's how you, you're operating as a team, as a group, and you're working towards a common goal of making that group and the tribe better. And that's something that, you know, we don't really have a lot of options where you see this type of traditional community organizing. That's not really, there aren't very many options like that in American society today, but it is one with fraternities. And I think for a lot of traditional right-wing guys, it's very cool to be a part of a group. You're a part of a group and that's like how you define yourself. That's how you, you know, you're working towards the betterment of the group itself. You're not just thinking of yourself as an individual. You're thinking of yourself as like my actions impact the larger collective and I have to work for the common goal of the, t of the team and not just myself. I'm not just the little special snowflake out there. I'm a member of this fraternity and that comes with certain amounts of responsibilities. And it's also like that, you know, I'm a part of a community that can help me out. And, uh, you know, these are people, these are my people. That's something that, as I said, you know, those type of formal organizations aren't really around anymore, even though we used to have many of them. Fraternal organizations were a big, were a big thing throughout American history, but no longer. Uh, so those are positive things. Um, but yeah, I would, you know, on the concluding part of my book, I think that was a little bit off about saying that this would be turned, that there would be a formalized resistance from fraternities and sororities uh, to wokeness. Uh, that was, I don't think that was necessarily occurred, but in terms of offering people an escape from the insanity on campus, fraternities still offer that, and I still support that in that regard, as it is a place where you can be free of the nonsense around you and hang out with uh, normal white people who are conservative and don't care about critical race theory and you know don't want to be free of you know the the dregs of a modern college campus it's just you know you get to you get to have that space there and you know they support traditions and it supports a community a communitarian way of thinking that you know we whites aren't really offered these opportunities so on that i would still be pro but yeah, it's not turning into a 
a strong political resistance. But I, don't, I think, you know, that political resistance to campus has to come from people who are funding it. Uh, so it has to come from the state, not necessarily from the students. So those are my concluding remarks. It's been a pretty long episode today. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I will have an IQ supplement coming up this week. It should be on Wednesday or Thursday. So be on the lookout for that. And until next time, stay respected.